All right, people, as you heard, we're bringing to the, together the worlds of AI and CAD in this episode, which is really like special for us because, you know, CAD, mechanical engineering, we study mechanical engineering. We love CADing in our free time. And AI, um, we've been having a lot of fun using AI tools in the past year or so. So bringing these two worlds together is pretty interesting. Well, and before we jump too far into it, mm -hmm. I think we should define CAD in case people don't know what it is, right? Computer-aided drawing, it's basically the way by which the vast majority of engineers designing things in the physical realm, right? So think even electronics engineers, mechanical engineers, et cetera, um, they use a computer to help them with their design drawings. And in many cases, it's not just creating a 2D print that you send to a supplier and helps you create. Oftentimes, you're trying to create a 3D model that's representative of the thing you want to design, create. You can do simulations in CAD. It's pretty awesome, but it, it's pretty fundamental basis for a lot of physical engineering is designing and creating these 3D models on a computer. For sure. And it's it's even more general than that because you have, like you said, if you look around your house right now, the items like computers, TVs, some CAD software was used to develop those. That That's an easy one. But then when you think about video games, like creating some of those components, uh, they also use some sort of computer-aided yeah. design tool to do that and accomplish that as well. Now, traditionally, CAD tools require, like there's a learning curve, whether you're using it for engineering. Um, there's, I would say like what, three or four main programs. Some of them great for big assemblies for like making cars, others great for hobbyists, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the design side for like the artistic creations, they have their own tools as well. So you have to kind of develop that skill set, that expertise for all these different tools, which means it's not very beginner friendly. No. Like it's, there's a barrier to entry there. So what happened here is that these folks at Polyspectra, who, if I'm not mistaken, their expertise is actually in resin yeah, for additive manufacturing. They make materials for 3D printing. Right. They were like, huh, we have AI. And AI is pretty good at understanding like just raw text. And there's these tools that allow us to generate code that creates CAD models. There's nothing out there right now that brings these two worlds together, even though there's a lot of AI tools for generating images and generating minute long videos. Shout out to OpenAI doing yeah. that recently. So they were like, what if what if we could like kind of crack this code and make that a possibility? Well, and, and it's like if you're someone who's inventing something or designing something, you have a big idea. Let's say you don't know CAD or you don't want to spend all this time going through all the intricacies of creating this base model that maybe you do some fine tuning and then you're ready to go. Um, it's relatively easy right now in the space of video generation, image generation, text generation to go to something like OpenAI and use one of their tools that are open source and, you know, pretty widely accessible. One of the, you know, fastest growing consumer applications ever. You can go in there and type like, oh, I want to make, uh, I don't know, a lamp with a dog on top of it. You can type that in to open AI's chat GPT mm -hmm. or their Dolly tool or their Sora tool. It'll create a video about it. It'll create pictures of it. It'll create text to help you sell it. But when you actually want to create and do the 3d model that you need to help engineer and manufacture and design something, there's nothing in the world that helps bridge that gap yet. And and that's where this, this team from Polyspectra came in and said, Hey, let's make this thing that can help you design anything, which is cool. Cause it's the, the name of the tech, the name of the tool is called anything. Um, how do you design anything? .xyz, X, Y, Z, the three dimensions. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. You, you just start with text um, and you can describe what you want and then it helps translate it into code that a machine, you know, computers can understand, which then is easily translatable into a 3D model. Yeah, yeah. And like like I kind of said at the beginning, there's really no, no one else that's doing anything quite like this, no. like raw text is straight up CAD design. But there are other, there's competition out there that's doing text to image to then a 2D or 3D. Now, apparently this just does not work quite that well, which is why these folks wanted to try this idea. And yeah, what they've done, like you said, is that they've built this AI model, which is able to take that raw text and generate that um, that out, output design that you want. Now, this is one of those rare topics that we talk about where you can actually, like as our listener, you can go to this article and you can access the link where you can work with this model. Like a lot try of it products, out for free. Try it out for free. We did it. Yeah. Both of us use this product because, again, we're interested in CAD and we're doing the research for the episode. Um, 
but it's it's rare that I feel like you get to experience one of the the products that we're talking about on, yeah. on, on this podcast. But I would definitely urge you guys to try it out because it is pretty interesting. And I have some feedback. So I, I will say, before I get into my feedback, uh, these folks have kind of highlighted some of the challenges for building an AI model like this. They, they made a point of saying, hey, look, the AI is kind of blind. Like it has no context. Like it can't visualize what you want to make from just the description. Yeah. Right. Um, it needs to turn that into these commands. There's that layer in between. And by the way, on top of that, to get an AI model, you need data to train it on. And it's really difficult because th this like code to CAD design, that's kind of like a niche thing where there's only like a couple experts that are working in that domain. Yeah, there's not, not a lot of examples to train on. Billions and billions of web articles out there for this AI to exactly. consume and train and learn on. That's part the large part of large language models, right? That requires a lot of training material to be proficient at it. So the large is kind of the, yeah. <laughs> the main driver. But, there. but the, there's not a large amount of data for this this AI engine to, to kind of consume and train itself and understand. Right. And then the last thing that they put in there, which personally, I don't think it's that big of a problem, at least not at this stage, is that there's no one right way to make a design in CAD. So there's like CAD competitions that happen every year for specifically on the engineering design software. Mm -hmm like you know, the Autodesk design, SolidWorks, whatever, where they show you a picture of a thing and then you and I, for example, would try to make it as fast as possible, as accurately as possible. And I, you know, I took a CAD class in college, which was similar. Like we'd all get a physical, you know, assembly to go measure on the table. We could take a bunch of pictures of it, take our calipers, take a bunch of measurements. And then it's like, all right, break, go to your desk and start designing this in CAD. That was interesting. And, and like you said, there was no one right way to do it. Um, a number of people could arrive at the correct answer, right? Which is a appropriately representative 3D model on the computer that matches the physical object that we were the looking at. Outcome, yeah. And, you know, I could have started by, if we we're designing this teacup on the table, I could have started by designing the cup part and you could have started by designing the handle. And maybe I, I did a sketch of the 2D profile of that cup and I uh, extruded it around in a cylinder and maybe you started by creating the cylinder and then put a hole in it extruded out the inside right there there's yeah. a number of different steps to get to the correct answer and maybe some of them are less computationally intensive maybe some are less memory intensive but there it it's all basically based off of the intuition of the designer there's no correct procedure for ai's to you know start to really master the, the correct steps on modeling something for sure for sure so those are like the challenges that they're already facing which is going to translate to issues on the uh, you know the outcome that you're going to get from this AI. But um, what something that stood out to me as a benefit of of the approach that they've taken is that the back end for the generation of the object there's there's like three different mo uh, models you can use to generate these objects. Mm -hmm. But the best one from I think both of our experiences we were like oh code one two three D yeah build one two three D is is the best one. And build one two three D is a open source Python library made by enthusiasts, like just out in the world, where you can write lines of Python code. Which, by the way, Python is one of the uh, I think most widely used programming language so. in the world at this point. Very easy to pick up on. Um, that's what's like when the AI when you say make a teacup, for example, um, it then goes to build one two three D. It's like okay, so I want you to draw a line with this command make a cylinder with this command, so on and so forth. So that's cool. that's what's doing the magic on the back end. And a lot of the challenges we talked about, right, are about trying to bridge the gap between large language models, which are good at language, and then into 3D space, right? Mm -hmm. the, that Bridging that gap is really challenging. Uh, what Ray and Polyspectra did here is they're like, all right, let's use this library that's already widely known, already really reputable, already used by a lot of people out there. That covers the part um, you know, it takes code and then it generates it into 3D text. All you're trying to do is then, you know, the, the core innovation here, the secret sauce is training AI on generating code in that language. And I say language very specifically because LLMs, large language models, are really, really good at generating language from language. So you take written English language or, you know, written Spanish language or, you know, pick, pick your language of choice, but take, take our human communicative language LLMs are getting really, really good at doing code generation, turning that into a language that computers can understand. So really, that, that's where they focused here is they've trained the AI to generate code 
that translates directly into a model like build one, two, three D that is easily generatable into a 3d CAD model. For sure. For sure. And now I, I want to jump into a little bit about my experiences of using this tool. Yeah. Um, so, so some things I noticed is that it tends to do pretty well with specific, like very specific step-by-step instructions. So something I tried out was for example, um, create me, create a four by four by four cube did that really well. And I was like, okay, now I want you to put a chamfer on the edges. Chamfer is like, you know, a flat edge yeah. on all sides. At first it struggled, it crashed, but then it, it was able to like recover and do it. And then I was able to, you know, ask for like some more slight modifications. However, if I said something like make, make around a cube or even in the article, there was, there was a, uh, they were like, this was the output we saw from uh, making a pipe with flanges. Even that input, it struggled with, it kept loading, and then it crashed on me. And I think even this is expected because at the end of this article, I forgot who wrote it, but whoever's writing it is like, hey, we know that this is kind of in a rough state, and we're actually like hoping you guys will use this tool, and the data that it gets from all these people's inputs will be used to train it and provide that missing data that we need to make this like this reliable, robust tool that can actually be used to take someone that has no idea how CAD works and allow them to create these 3D objects to launch a business or launch their creative endeavor. Well, and let me just say, you said you don't know who wrote it. It was Ray. He is the CEO of Polyspec. Gotcha. Wrote this article. He actually reached out to me on Twitter and he's like, yo, check this out. Is, is this tool cool? And that's when I texted you. I was like, dude, for but we got to cover this. And then he's like, oh, by the way, I wrote an article about it on Weavall. I was like, cool. We can absolutely cover it on the podcast. Um, well, Ray, if you're listening, uh, one thing I like to call out whenever it's, it's there the formatting of this article was great. Yeah. The flow of information, chef's kiss. Yeah, we it, it makes it really, really easy for us to communicate technology well when the article that we're basing it off of is really, really good at communicating technology well. For sure. But I, I will say, Ray deserves a shout out here. Um, he's the founder of Polyspectra and CEO. Like we said, they make high performance resins for 3D printing. He's been working at the intersection of material science and additive manufacturing for a while and really one of the core mainstays of additive manufacturing is doing 3D CAD design mm-hmm. like this. So he's an expert here. He also was on the Forbes 30 under 30 list. Nice. So a little bit of a killer. I uh, love it, Ray. But I obviously appreciate you reaching out to us on Twitter, being open to feedback about this. He's been super open, like saying, hey, show me where it breaks. Show me where it works, works well. Show me where it doesn't. And it kind of adopts this uh, mentality you were saying where community involvement is one of the most significant parts of this. He knows that it's early. He knows that it's, you know, just a fledgling model starting to learn how to walk. But if our contributions help to refine and improve the AI's capabilities, this thing could become super dangerous in the future where it's like, you know, when you type in pipe with flange, it loads 100% of the time and you can start modifying that into something more complex. Like I want a liquid natural gas pipeline with 12 holes, you know, like one of the standard designs in in an industry. And the reason I I say that is, a lot of engineers at really, really well established companies, I'm thinking of like big three automotive OEMs, um, when they're going to design something new, they have a catalog that they can pull from. For when, sure. When they say, oh, I want to design a, a seat, they just go through their catalog and they can pull the previous seat and then they just make some major, minor modifications on that. Um, that's what makes it really, really easy and really, really fun for those people to do the engineering part because they don't have to start from scratch. Um, I'd like to think that this tool could democratize that head start to everyone trying to do design, whether that's professional engineers, designers, artists, students, people who are just trying it for the first time for fun, making it more approachable to where they can literally just type in an idea of what their 3D model is and basically get that head start that a lot of professional engineers at these well-established companies get, um, kind of removing the barrier to entry to being able to do successful CAD. So I agree with you there, and I wanna extend that even a little bit further. One of the things I remember my first time using, I think SolidWorks, one of the things I loved was the hole wizard. Like making a hole seems like such a trivial thing, but oh my God, is it challenging. Well, especially with threads. Exactly, with threads. And it's it's just such a pain to like go from scratch, make that. But this wizard is like, oh, oh, you want to make this hole? What's the entrance? What kind of thread? Like everything. And it just makes it for you, right? And as an engineer, you get to focus on, like you said, the fun parts, like creating the rest of the components that you need and the assembly and making sure everything's working right. So when I when I was experiencing this AI model, the only thing that came to my mind was like, once this reach reaches a point where it's like mature enough to give me just not even like full on assembly, just one component the way I wanted to, like let's say ninety nine percent of the time, this would be a killer plugin. Where instead of a whole wizard, it's just 
part wizard. Yeah. And I can go in and say, um, give me a two by four that's like, you know, to this cut with yeah. these angles or whatever. Or like, give me a bowl that's like this. That would be so cool and so applicable across the board. Like, it wouldn't even have to be program native. So that's what came to my mind. And I, honestly, I think my mind might have just kind of gone to that because Visual Studio Code has Copilot for programmers where you get to write a comment that says, uh, spit out the code to parse this text for this thing. And it just gives you that block of code. But as the programmer, you have full control over the rest of the program. Well, and I'll say like personally, as someone who doesn't have a lot of coding experience, being able to use a tool like that, or I sometimes type my queries into chat GPT. The barrier to entry is so much lower. Right? It, it makes it less intimidating. It makes it more attainable for me to make something that works in the real world. Um, I, I, I liken this to like another intellectual revolution maybe where more people are going to be able to have all sorts of technology and all sorts of tools available to help them turn their ideas into real life. Um, obviously this is probably, you know, many, 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 uh, code generations in the future for this tool, anything, but it's really interesting for us to see, like, you know, obviously we both tried it. We're sending each other screenshots like, Oh, look what I made. Look what I made. It is a little buggy right now. Mm -hmm. It is really, really early. And Ray knows that. And, um, but it's cool for us to see like the domain that this is centered in. It's poised to make a huge difference. Um, if not just for hobbyists and de designers and engineers for like a lot of people in the world who have an idea and want to be able to turn that into something real. Um, I'm going to get really corny here, get but corny. their, uh, polyspectra's motto is make it real. And I feel like this is like right up their alley, right? They're letting people turn things from their imagination into real things and kind of giving them a head start on that through the most challenging part of it, which is getting something, an idea from your head or a sketch on the whiteboard into like a 3d CAD model that you can actually edit and send to a supplier and say, go make this. Yeah, for sure. And there's another thing I want to talk about before we like move on from this, uh, an integration and the analogy between Copilot. When I'm programming and there's something that I'm not like, I don't want to waste my time too much on, on like researching and this AI spits out the answer for it. I find myself like looking through its logic and kind of building that knowledge over time of like, oh, that's how that worked. So when I'm thinking about like the utilization of this tool or the use case of this tool, imagine like getting a part that is you as a beginner, you didn't know how to make, but this thing spits it out for you. And in addition to that, because they were talking about how there's multiple ways to get to the end point, right? Mm -hmm. You also get the history of how that part was made. So if it's a cylinder that has a hole in it, it's like, oh, we first made the sketch, we extruded it, and then we put the hole in. And you're like, oh, cool, that's how I can make it on my own if I ever wanted to. Well, yeah, I was going to mention that too. I feel like even after using this, I used all my free credits. So I, I did 30 <laughs> of these, burned right through them right away, Ray. So I'll let you know I loved it. But um, you're doing those 30 free generations. I saw the build one, two, three D code that was generated as a part of that. And exactly. I'm like, I think I'm starting to learn this. Like, yeah. This would be a really interesting way for me to do CAD. Um, it, it makes me think of when I worked at Tesla, we were like stuck in a really challenging design problem. And they brought in a bunch of like really expert CAD engineers. They're contractors. They came in for a couple of weeks to help us like do a bunch of CAD work. And I noticed these guys, they barely even touch their mouse. Right, they're doing almost all of the almost all the designing just by typing commands into their computer, and they're like, "This is the most efficient way." Then you can use the mouse to help pan around and like build assemblies and stuff like that after. But I thought that was super interesting because now I started looking at that build one two three D code, and I'm like, maybe this is attainable for me. Um, and obviously, I don't think I'm there yet. But after yeah, after using a tool like this for a little while, it definitely helped me to understand like how that this Python code build one two three D could be super useful and made it feel like it's not out of my own reach to learn that, even though I have literally zero professional coding Absolutely. Experience. I totally agree with you. And in terms of our uh, experience using it, one thing I wanted to point out, um, one of the prompts I gave it was like, make me an L bracket. And what came out was definitely not an L bracket. I think I even said it yeah. to you. So I was thinking like, um, they were talking about how other attempts at creating something like this was taking text to image and then the 2D, 3D object to be created. And obviously what they're doing different, what we've been hammering on this entire episode is you take raw text that comes up with the code that then creates the object. I think it could be very interesting to have a step that's kind of like a closed feedback loop that says, now that the object is created, right? Um, take an image of what it's, yeah. what it looks like and then do a query of what I asked for, an L bracket. Do those two match? If they don't, reattempt until you get closer 
to like the desired input. No, I, I agree, man. Like one of the things I did to kind of gut check myself when you create, when you said L bracket, I was like, is this like a terminology that only you and I know? And I went and looked in Google and it's like L bracket. Oh, that's exactly what exactly I want. Exactly what I want. So that's what it, I, 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 I do think that'd be interesting to kind of use that. Again, I think the approach here is correct, which is instead of trying to use one of these, you know, these really powerful AI models to generate an image and then try and convert that image into a 3D CAD model, that that's really, really challenging. I think they've got the correct approach Absolutely. here, which is like language to other language. And this other language happens to be this programming language that uh, is used to render 3D CAD images, right? So you go language to language to CAD. I think that's the right step. I but totally agree. agree. The, the first step there, the language, you know, human language to computer language translation, they could absolutely use um, images of things uh, basically to improve that translation so that when I say um, pipe with flange, that worked well. But when I said elbow pipe with flange, it didn't work well, that you can start to train this model to understand what an elbow the pipe with flange it, looks yeah, like. Yeah. So then it becomes much more robust for generating all these different types of geometries and shapes. I totally agree. And I think that step... There's a, I don't want to get too much into it. Couple, no, last year we talked about MIT um, AI efforts to allow LLMs to better understand context because when it came to image generation, they were struggling with the placement of different items. I think this could be like what we're talking about. The closed feedback loop could be like a little band aid, but seeing those two come together and getting the context uh, relationship embedded into this AI could make this user experience much better. All that to say, I had a, I actually ended up enjoying myself using this product more because it wasn't working because I felt more like a contributor to this effort yeah. that I am so interested in. Again, because I love CAD, I would love to see everyone like my mom being able to use AI to generate CAD files for whatever she wants. So I'm pretty invested in what the future of this looks like. Yeah, I will say it's it's really cool. It's designed to be shared designed to be collaborated with even like when i create a model i can just copy paste the url and mm -hmm. share it with you and you get the same model um, i think it's really really interesting it's designed so that there's this community aspect of it which is absolutely required because folks were telling you go toy around play with it tell the polyspectra team what works and what doesn't because that will help the entire community as a whole be able to improve this thing and make it to a point where like we're saying it's like this awesome wizard tool that you can just go in your cad tool and type Hey, I want this, you know, yeah. I want this exact geometry and it's going to spit it out for you. Yeah. No, the, the future looks pretty exciting for all things computer aided design and I'm here for it. Yeah. Me too, man. All right. I think, is that it? Do you, should we do a quick summary? Yeah, let's wrap it up. All right, folks, uh, computer aided design. It's very commonly used by engineers to create physical products, but artists still also use it to create uh, models for video games and whatnot. Typically, it requires a lot of domain expertise. You have to have the skill set to know how to use programs X, Y, and Z to create whatever products you want. Well, in the world of AI, we've quickly seen domain expertise kind of go away or at least remove the barrier to entry to creatives, for example, creating images, creating short-term videos, or even text. So why can't we do that for computer-aided design models? Well, the folks at Polyspectra, they want to tackle this problem. They want to take raw text spoken English language or any language really, and convert it to code language that can create any object that we want. In fact, their tool is readily available now. You can go look it up, nething.xyz, to try and see what you end up getting. But I really want to emphasize you being part of this community and trying this tool out is actually what's going to lead to its success. So please, please go and try it out. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, like like you said, love the wrap up there. Tool is called anything.xyz. We're going to link we that in the show spell notes. Spell that out? Yeah, N-E, the like letters the N-E, letters N -E. N -E -T -H -I -N -G dot X-Y-Z. Um, pronounce anything because yeah. you can, in theory, like anything. design anything. <laughs> yeah. um, we're going to link that in the show notes. We're also going to uh, link an episode or link an article that's written about it, kind of lets you know, understand the challenges they went through trying to teach AI how to CAD, which is, it, it was a challenging journey, but it looks like we're, we're on the first step there. For sure. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. As always. Catch you in the next one. Peace.